Welcome to Norton From Home, online programming for the Norton Museum of Art. My name is Glenn Tomlinson, and I'm the William Randolph Hearst Curator of Education at the Museum. Tonight, we want to thank the Gale and Paul Gross Education Endowment Fund and Art Bridges, our supporters, for making this curator conversation possible. If you're watching this program live, please feel free to leave a question in the chat and we'll respond during the Q&A that follows our speaker's presentation. Right now, it's my great pleasure to introduce Rachel Gustafson, who is Assistant Curator at the Norton Museum of Art. Among Rachel's many achievements, she is the author of the Norton Museum's recent publication, Oldenburg and Van Bruggen, The Typewriter Eraser, A Favored Form. And of course, this celebrates the great Typewriter Eraser Scale X on view on Heyman Plaza right outside the museum's door. Today, she joins us to discuss her most recent exhibition of contemporary works on paper, currently on view in the museum's Cox Gallery. The show is called What's New? Recent Gifts to the Norton, and it features works on paper from 1970s to 2016. Rachel, welcome to Norton from Home. Thank you so much, Glenn, for that great introduction and warm welcome. Hello, everyone. Good evening. And as Glenn mentioned, I am Assistant Curator Rachel Gustafson, and I am here tonight to talk about what's new, recent acquisitions from one of the most recent collection-based exhibitions uh, to open here at the Norton Museum. And Glenn was absolutely right. Uh, the ex exhibition does include works on paper, such as drawings and prints, but we actually do have some paintings as well. And as he mentioned, they range from the 1970s to 2016. It includes a diverse sampling of imagery and techniques from really a cross section of different artists, which is what happens when you look at recent acquisitions that come into the museum. They're going to be quite diverse if we're lucky enough. So while the exhibition does not include all of the recent acquisitions that have recently come to the museum, it does provide insight into a selection of artworks that have been either gifted to the museum by individual patrons or actually acquired through uh, donations from different friends groups, such as the Young Friends Acquisition Council, which I am very lucky to help oversee. And so with that, we will get started here and move into our next slide, please. So what we'll be doing tonight, just to walk you through what you'll be experiencing, is we'll be looking at four different artworks in detail. But before we got into those four works, what I wanted to do was actually do sort of a virtual walk around Cox Gallery. It is quite a small gallery right off the Great Hall. So I thought we could go ahead and look at all four walls um, to kind of experience what you would experience as a visitor, visitor to the museum. Now, as some of you might know, we are open four days a week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sundays now. So if you do feel comfortable coming into the museum and seeing these works in person, as you know, I always encourage this. I think the real artworks can never really be fully understood um, through reproductions, but alas, we will continue virtually here um, to give you a little walk around. Um, starting from the left on the screen here, the, the first image, uh, we have an expressive woodcut uh, from the self-taught artist Francesco Clemente. Um, it's a composition that merges self-portraiture and an idea of metamorphosis. The artist is actually depicting himself in a moment of transformation between states of maleness and femaleness. In, in the middle, we have a very tactile painting by Richard Pousset Dart. That's one of the four we'll be exploring in more detail. And moving right along to the right-hand side, there is a drawing uh, by the celebrated stage director and visual artist, Robert Wilson. He created this drawing in response to his production of Hamlet Machine, which was written by German playwright Heiner Müller. And so what you have in that drawing is actually kind of a set production or something that Robert Wilson would have drew either in the early phases of the production as something he wanted to see happen in the play or something that he might have drew, drawn after he created that. It's a, little, it's a little vague, but either way, related exactly to Hamlet Machine. Moving along, uh, as we continue down the hall, I just wanted to show you that this is the same wall, just continuing down the way. Uh, there are two works that we'll be uh, exploring more closely here on the left. The first you see is the Sylvia Plymouth Mangold, and then in the middle, it's a Paul Morrison. And to 
give you a little bit of a better view here, um, you can see these works straight on. So again, the Sylvia Plymouth Mangold to the left, the Paul Morrison in the middle. And then all the way on the right is this really lovely print by David Hockney. It's perhaps one of my favorites in the exhibition due to the artist's engagement with what was really new technology at the time. The work was created in 1986 and that new technology was the humble copier machine. Now Hockney worked with a copier machine to create a series of more than 30 prints of which this example in the exhibition is a part of. And he used that copier machine to layer colors by passing the same sheets through the machine multiple times. So really a fun engagement uh, with what was a new technology at the time. Now, if you were to go ahead and look across the hall from the Great Hall right into uh, the Baum Gallery or Modern European Gallery beyond, uh, what you'd see is four more works that constitute the rest of this exhibition. What you have to the left here um, is a 2016 etching by the Scottish artist uh, Peter Doig. He was influenced by the German Danish painter Emil Nold in this deep blue sea of two passengers in a small boat. It's really quite luscious in terms of its color palette. And to the right, a very important print from Jasper Johns titled The Seasons. And that work brings together the compositions of four paintings that Johns made between 1985 and 1986. So when you get a closer look at this work, you'll notice the print is separated into four different panels. And each of those panels would have been um, made a kind of a, almost of a reproduction of his earlier paintings, each painting consisting of one panel within this print. Um, each of those panels is dedicated to one of the seasons, summer, spring, fall, and winter. And like the paintings, uh, this print is riddled with symbolism, art historical references, and auto autobiographical nuance. Um, from the seasonal symbols, you'll see a snowman to a full tree canopy to emphasize this notion of spring and even the passage of time. There's also other devices in this composition, such as the repeating American flag. That's kind of John's own self-referential nod to an important subject matter in his early career. So really an, an interesting print and one that um, we're really happy to have into the collection. Now, if we move to the other wall, um, We'll start further on the right this time. You see a large woodcut from 1986 by Sean Scully. Scully is known for his paintings and sculpture based on his unique approach to geometric abstraction, but he's also a very skilled printmaker, as we see in this work titled Standing Two. Um, and the last work on our virtual walkabout of the gallery is the work to the left by Ellsworth Kelly, and it's where we will jump off into our deeper explorations. So um, this was one of the very few works that we were able to acquire during the national shutdown during quarantine. Uh, and this is all thanks to the Young Friends Acquisition Council. Members of this group uh, join uh, to be part of a, a committee whose funds help support the acquisition of art at the museum. And so because of them, we were able to pool our resources together and buy this really interesting multiple. So while it is considered a multiple, it does have unique qualities and they're worth looking at um, in just a little bit more, uh, more detail here um, in this solitary image. Um, what he's done is he's engaged with a very experimental process to create a series of works from which this print is part of. Uh, that series is called Colored Paper Images from 1976. And um, most people would be very familiar with Kelly as a, as a key figure in post-war abstraction. In terms of composition, um, the, the work that we just saw was very much in Kelly's aesthetic. It considered three classic elements of composition. You have line, color, and shape. And very much uh, like Scully, he was a painter and a sculptor, but also very much involved in printmaking. And it was a central part of his career and often worked with very notable printmaking studios. And that's what we see here on the screen. We see Kelly at work with one of those printmaking studios. In this case, he was working with Tyler Graphics, a fine printmaking studio in Bedford, New York, where we see Kelly on the ground uh, working on this series. Uh, the photographs that are seen here are by Betty Fisk. 
So Tyler Graphics, again, uh, the place where Kelly is doing this series was run by Kenneth Tyler, who many of you might be familiar of because of his uh, groundbreaking printmaking studio called Gemini GEL in Los Angeles, and he helped establish that. So in making this series, Kelly worked collaboratively with the printmaker and uh, a Woodstock, Connecticut paper mill, actually, to develop a very inventive process where handmade paper became Kelly's medium. So when you think of printmaking, you're usually thinking of ink, perhaps, pushed onto paper. In this case, they're using paper pushed onto paper, and we'll get into that in just a moment. But the blue and black curv uh, curvilinear segments that we saw earlier in the picture of the work, they represent two colors from a palette of nearly 50 that Kelly developed to create this series. And with that palette of 50, he then dyed cotton paper pulp. So the pulp from there is then spooned into molds and that's what we see on the screen here. We see Kelly on the floor with a big metal flexible ruler and that was used as a mold to create the compositions or some of the compositions within this series. He would also work with masking tape and acetate to build the molds as well. From there, once the color was spooned into the molds, they'd actually use the press, a vertical press to fuse the wet colored paper pulp onto a base sheet of white handmade paper. And what happens when they're pushing that dye onto the paper is the compression allows for some of the colors to bleed. And that's what we see uh, here in this slide uh, where the compression causes uh, the pulp to almost push out from underneath the shaped molds. And that detail that we see on the screen, particularly in the lower left size, side of the composition. In this unique print from this series, uh, you see surprising variations from impression to impression. So let's, for example, say that this particular print from the series is made of an edition of 30. Um, in each of those renditions, each time the pulp was pushed into the molds and then applied to the paper, they're going to have a different kind of variation just because of the nature of the series. And just again, to give some more background into how this is done, I wanted to show some additional images of, uh, of Kelly at work. Again, with Kenneth Tyler, we see uh, all the way on the left-hand side, we have Kelly and Kenneth Tyler um, applying the colored paper uh, onto an image mold. In this case, they're actually working in a more rectangular shape to, to create the, the particular print that they're working on. Uh, in the middle, you have Kenneth Tyler, Ellsworth Kelly, and one of the workshop assistants. He's the gentleman with the lovely pipe in his mouth, uh, as, again, as they spoon this pulp onto the, into the mold, onto the sheet. And then at the end, you see Kelly studying a newly pressed print and deciding where he's going to take it next. And again, just to show you the other side of this work, um, because I think on, on actually on the right side of the composition, you get actually even a little bit more bleeding. I think it's a little bit easier to see. And for folks on uh, the virtual lecture tonight that might consider themselves uh, Kelly aficionados, it's probably a little surprising to see this messy form uh, revealed. It's kind of an outlier compared to the artist's usual flat surfaces and very precise lines. But again, this work does retain those basic characteristics of Kelly's vocabulary super interested in color, line, and shape. And now we'll move on to the second of our four closer looks here to consider the work of Richard Pousset Dart. And I would say this is probably one of the most tactile experiences in this installation. This is one, I, again, all of the works really do need to be seen in person, uh, but, but the, the surface quality of this work is really something to behold um, and something that's that's worth getting up close to, I would say. It's, it's definitely a unique experience to see this work because on the screen, what you read is a black and white composition. In person, there's actually much more going on. Now, this work was gifted to the museum by Esther and Sumner Feldberg. They'd gifted nearly 30 objects to the museum in 2019. And um, until very recently, we had identified this work at the Norton as an untitled painting. We There was no reference. There was paperwork that we had, but every, every time we consulted the paperwork, it referred to the work as untitled. But very luckily, just recently, just last month, actually, uh, we'd been in touch with the uh, Richard Pousset Dart Foundation 
And I'm very thankful to their executive director, Charles Duncan, who shared with us tonight the real title of the work. And this is the first time we're sharing this with the general public. Uh, in fact, I have to change the label tomorrow to have the correct uh, title up there for visitors. But the correct title is Black and White Garden. And so as of yesterday, you would have seen it as still untitled in the galleries. And if you come tomorrow, it'll have the appropriate name. So again, we cannot thank Charles Duncan enough for his essential research in making sure we present the most um, telling information about this particular painting. So uh, what, Char what Charles was able to share when he reached out to us is when we received the work, as we saw in that earlier installation picture, it came to us framed. And what is hidden from view is that on the back side, according to the foundation's records, it says black and white garden inscribed on the stretcher on the verso of the painting. So it's not something we were able to see because we didn't take it out of its original housing. We left it in the frame. And so again, this part of the research is essential and one of the wonderful experiences we get at the museum and working with artists, estates and foundations. And if we can move on to the next slide, please. Again, I really think it's the surface of this painting that is the site to be seen. Um, there's a lot going on in terms of the elemental forms that we'll also talk about in just a minute, but I did want to start with the surface so folks could get a real understanding uh, of what lies beyond the seemingly black and white composition. When you get close to this work, other colors begin to emerge. You see blues, turquoise, I see yellow in certain places. And to achieve this, Pousset Dart meticulously built up the surface of the painting. And he did this through many, many dabs of pigment or paint. And what we see on closer inspection is much more, again, than this black and white composition, but really a nuanced layering of colors. And for those of you who might not be aware with Pousset Dart as an artist, he really is part of that first generation of abstract expressionist painters. Um, in, in as early as 1948, his work is exhibited alongside Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, and Barnett Newman, just to name a few. Um, but while he was gaining traction in New York in the late 1940s, he did decide to leave the city and he would move just a little bit north in the early 1950s to establish a studio in Rockland County, New York, which is what we see pictured here on the left side of the screen. Uh, I should mention that the foundation is in the final stages of preserving uh, Poussette Dart's home and studio. And this is where Black and White Garden would have been created. Uh, after moving there in the early 1950s, Poussette Dart lived there and worked there throughout the rest of his life. So I should also point out that, that these works, you know, oftentimes artwork never happens in a vacuum. There are other things going on, not just the one painting is being painted at one time in most cases. And Black and White Garden is one of several paintings from uh, the 1970s and 80s that approach this seemingly simple black and white palette in a very different way and often engaging with um, these symbols that we see throughout them. I'm showing you another example here from the foundation's website, a work called Wall of Signs, which Poussette Dart started the very same year that Black and White Garden and the Norton's collection was created. And again, what can't be ignored beyond the black and white palette here are the symbols that are embedded throughout the composition. From his childhood, Pousset Dart was very interested in the aesthetic quality of elemental forms. And when I say elemental forms, what I mean are perhaps geometric forms such as a cross or an organic form such as a fish or a bird shape. These are forms that Pousset Dart noticed had reoccurred throughout different cultures all across the globe and all throughout time. And what Charles had pointed out to me in our email exchange is something that Poussette Dart really explored is this question of what is it about these forms that motivates an aesthetic interest and really generates an emotional response in humans. And that was something that Poussette Dart explored throughout his career. Um, but interestingly enough, you know, he did not start as a painter. He began his artistic career as a sculptor, um, engaging in the direct carving of stone. He was particularly fascinated in the abstract sculptures of the French artist Henri Goudier Bredska. Uh, Goudier made small carvings out of brass, and uh, Poussette Dart really tried his hand at this as well, which is what we see in these two examples. These are pocket sized, flat uh, brass sculptures, and they also engage in, again, this notion of. Uh, 
uh, elemental forms. So you have a cross, you have a heart shape, you have an organic sinuous line. And um, in the 1940s, he began to transition away from being a sculptor and into painting. Um, but he never let go of these elemental forms. It was something that persisted. And in his paintings, he would cycle between the compositions that are really dense with the forms, such as black and white garden. So sometimes he would just focus on a central form. So some people might be more familiar on his works where he's just engaging with a circle perhaps, but he's still applying that same uh, dabbing technique of paint. But as a point of contrast, I did want to point out another work in our collection made by Pousset Dart. Now this is a work uh, that's uh, slightly earlier. It's in the early 1960s. It's called Symbolic Journey. And again, we have these forms interwoven with line in, in, a, in a painting that really kind of makes your head spin when you look at all the different colors um, and how things are connected throughout the composition, uh, but really quite a juxtaposition when you compare uh, these two works side by side. Next slide, please. And you see uh, maybe perhaps some of these reoccurring forms, you might get hints of it, but the palettes are so vastly different um, that it's worth comparing, it's worth seeing the two together. And now we'll move on to our third painting that we'll look at closely. Now this particular, this is a painting, it's a painting on paper. So whereas uh, Pousset Darts was a painting on a canvas support, here we have a painting on paper. And it's one, uh, one work within a larger body of work that Sylvia Plymouth Mangold has explored for more than a 40 year period. And I think it's something that still continues today from what I understand. It's the result of a devoted observation of the trees surrounding her home and studio in Washingtonville, New York. In this case, what we see is a linden tree and it's painted in spring of 1988. When you look at this body of work holistically, and we'll do that in just a moment, I think what you see in these compositions are, are less a document and perhaps more a notion uh, of perhaps looking or the experience of what looking feels like and of time passing, kind of similar actually when you think of Jasper John's seasons and the way that he would use different seasonal symbols to depict that passing of time. Sylvia Plymouth Mangold does that as well in this body of work. So I should just historically point out that Sylvia Plymouth Mangold um, early in her career was very much part of the burgeoning art scene in New York in the 1960s. And this is some pictures here of that time. You see her painting in her studio, but also uh, with her, her husband and fellow artist Robert Mangold and their child on one of the rooftops in New York. Now, initially, Sylvia Plymouth Mangold uh, gained early critical recognition for her paintings of wooden floors and mirrors, and later of hyper-realistic depictions of tape and rulers that were conceptually aligned with the aesthetics of her minimalist peers at the time. And so here, this is a work in the Norton's collection uh, that shows this engagement with uh, a trick of the eye where you think you're looking at perhaps masking tape on a substrate, but really this is a painting. And this work actually is installed within the Norton's, uh, what we call our minimalist gallery at the Norton. And, and here's a picture, um, next slide please, of uh, what we call Davis Gallery that, that houses many of our minimalist works at the moment. Um, an earlier period in time right now, those Donald Judds that are central on view are actually not on view. But what you see to the left is this Sylvia Plymouth Mangold work that I just pointed out. And it's hung alongside uh, her husband's work, Robert Mangold. But just to give a better context here of the bigger body of work, um, in 2013, the Norton created an exhibition uh, organized by Director of Curatorial Affairs and Contemporary Curator Cheryl Brute Van uh, that really looked at this long engagement with the trees surrounding her environment. And it was part of our Recognition of Art by Women series. In some of these very early landscapes, the Trump de la tape around the painting's perimeter uh, that we saw in the earlier example, 
then moves into this body of work. While you think you're just looking at perhaps a landscape, what you actually see in this example is all around the border of the painting is this notion of tape. So if you were to see this work up close, you'd notice a very thin border that goes around the perimeter of the painting. And that is homage to her inclusion of tape and a very a hyper-realistic tape that she's continuing throughout her career. And then if we move on to the next, here we are. And sometimes uh, you can really see that in, in this example that's central on the wall, you can see that what, it, what appears to be just, again, a landscape, what's happening is she's almost suggesting that this is a picture uh, taped to another substrate. So this idea of borders that continue. And when you look more closely at our particular work, but before we do that, I just wanted to show really the range of scale of these works. So they really do run, run a, a quite interesting range of sizes. And then when you come back to our work, this is so hard to see in the reproduction, but when you come and you see it in person, a very, very translucent relief of that tape or that notion of tape for a viewer, uh, they will see that that remains. And so it's a really interesting piece to enter our collection because it allows us to go and look back at the 2013 exhibition and see how it continued throughout and how it was something that Sylvia Plymouth Mangold was always interested. And when you see these two paintings side by side, it's hard to believe that perhaps there is any relation between the two, but it's again, this play that Sylvia Plymouth Mangold is integrating into the composition to bring a hint of this or a trace of the tape back into the composition at the very edges. And I know you might not believe me by seeing this on the screen, but I promise you it's there. And I did want to read a quote for, for, for you that Sylvia Plymouth Mangold wrote about this particular body of work where she does look closely at trees. She says, I'm really about looking to see what I might not see with the eye, but what she discovers as she paints. And I found that really fascinating. Now we'll move on to the last work that we're looking at closely here tonight. Um, this is the work of Paul Morrison. And what you see on the screen is a print by the artist. Um, he is rather well known for his black and white compositions that really balance between things that feel familiar and things that feel rather unfamiliar. Um, in this example, we have very geographically uh, bold uh, scene and it, engage, it engages with uh, magnifi magnified and shifting scales. So in the center, you have this monumental flower and big leaves, right? As well as a cartoonish kind of uh, flowers in the lower left and right corners. And, and then beyond it, you see a tree that might be in scale with the landscape beyond. Uh, it actually, um, the big central, flower actually nearly obscures what appears to be almost like a fairy tale Hamlet that lies beyond in the background here of the composition. And Morrison often uses botanical drawings, cartoons, historical engravings, and children's books as source material to create his compositions. And uh, they span well beyond prints. He works with all sorts of works on paper, but also creates uh, paintings, sculpture, film, and site-specific installations. And that's what we see here on the screen, actually. This is uh, an installation at the Hammer. And so just to give you an idea of how these black and white graphically charged uh, compositions translate to a site-specific application, and then we'll move along to see the Norton's version. So for those of you who are ever here at the museum and perhaps coming to an Art Speaks lecture or a special luncheon, right off the main entry to the museum, there is a room called the Corman Room. And if you were to walk into there, you would see a site-specific Paul Morrison installation. This work is called Lucent Garden, and it was one of the three works that was commissioned by the museum when we reopened in 2019. And this is a gold leaf mural. Uh, this is very interesting because it's not that black and white composition that you saw, right? It, here now we have, I believe it was 15,000 sheets of gold leaf that were applied to these walls, um, stencils that were involved, uh, as well as a removal process, almost like a positive negative, which is really, uh, really seen quite more obviously when you continue looking around the room. So 
Uh, next slide, please. And just moving to the north side of the building, we see all these characteristic traits that were in the print applied to the site-specific installations, uh, varying scales of botanical prints, for example, or different imagery that at one point is quite large and at other points uh, quite small. In, in, in this, this detail that I'm about to show you here is actually a detail uh, closer up of what we just saw, where he's really playing with that positive negative space to leave the imprint of what appears to be a fern or some other flora uh, in really what is a beautiful part of this room, one of my favorites of the site specific installations. And this is the last wall. So just again, to give you a full view of the entire room, if you were to come and visit and see the site specific installation. Now, I should point out that there are some themes or perhaps motifs in Morrison's work that does repeat again and again. In this example, I'm showing you um, the big carnation that's center in the composition. Right below it, to the right-hand side, you see a circle. And that's supposed to suggest a moon shape. And in the Norton's Lucent Garden, you see that shape reappear. And it reappears on the top left side of the wall. In fact, you only see half the crescent. You only see half the moon, almost like a crescent. Um, and it's realized in a negative space, right, rather than the positive space. And again, to compare side by side on the other uh, part of the wall, I think this is really a nice example to show that, again, that playing of scale where he's using larger bits of flora and fauna um, really magnified as opposed to what you would consider a more realistic scale. And so in all that would be completing the lecture tonight, the, the discussion of what's new, recent acquisitions. And it did uh, look at a few different applications of artwork. So we had paintings, we had prints, we had uh, unique paper pulp works. And so I hope that gave you a good sampling of what you were to see if you came to the museum. Um, and if not, you had your special walk around this evening with me. Um, so with that, I think we'll move on to questions. I think Glenn will come back with me to to, to start that portion. Well, thank you Aries. very much. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was a wonderful tour and, and a wonderful introduction to those artists' work and, 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 and really looking closely at the process was just, just really a treat. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of the artists uh, in the show are working um, with paper, you know, the, the pulp or as a, as a, as a surface for uh, graphic arts and things like that. Um, and, uh, and of course we think of Jasper Johns and that moment when Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg seemed to, you know, quote unquote, rediscover printmaking in the, in the late fifties. And of course that that's an overstatement, but that, that was sort of how, you know, it was sort of that's presented cold. at one yes. point. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but how do you see, how do you see artists using uh, paper today? Well, I would say printmaking is, is still very much alive and well in the contemporary art practice. I think of, for example, uh, we have a beautiful, I think it's a six panel print by the artist Julie Maritou, who's using multiple different uh, forms of printmaking to create a really um, almost a very gestural work. And so she's engaging in printmaking on a very large scale. That particular work that I mentioned uh, took up one wall out of an entire gallery. So really scaling up in size to perhaps a more domestic scale that some printmaking of an earlier generation had explored. Um, beyond that, um, when I think of how contemporary artists are using paper today, my mind immediately goes to a an artist who's on view at the museum right now, Maria Barrio, who's, who's using different colored paper to create her compositions. Um, and if you haven't been to the museum to see her work, it's definitely, it's not printmaking by any measure, but she's using paper to build the foundation and build her compositions to build what we see in our works. And that actually closes, I believe this Sunday. So if you haven't been able to see it yet, that's a wonderful example of how contemporary artists are continuing to engage with paper-based art. Absolutely, no. That's 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 a really good point, um, both as a material, but also as a surface for a, a more uh, a traditional print print format, or 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 even uh, drawing. Um, 
I, I, I do want to encourage our listeners, if you have any questions uh, or would uh, like to ask Rachel something, please um, uh, add your notes to the chat and uh, we will uh, take your questions. Um, the title of your exhibition is What's New, um, but what's new is not all that's new at the Norton, right? There are <laughs> other right. uh, exciting new um, works to be to be to be seen um, right. this this spring. Um, do you want to share a little bit about some of those? Absolutely. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, what's new recent acquisitions is by far and away not the extent of everything that's new at the Norton. Um, other things to consider, we recently had a wonderful loan come to us of a Charles Ray sculpture that can now be seen in our sculpture garden called Huck and Jim. That is just a show stopping work. It will grab your attention and um, something that cannot be missed. It will be on view for quite some time, but still worth the trek out to the most Eastern part of our garden to see. Um, if you don't feel like going into that muggy May weather that we've been experiencing. Uh, you can stay within the galleries and certainly see more works on view. Um, just recently, Cheryl Brood Van, our contemporary curator and director of curatorial affairs also installed a work, uh, a sculptural work by Awal Arisku. And that work is really interesting. Uh, he's using a bust of Nefertiti the Egyptian first wife of the pharaoh, uh, and actually applying sequence. So he's turned this Nefertiti bust into a spinning disco ball. And it's installed right there in the historic uh, entrance to the museum. So quite a juxtaposition between old and new, uh, but really something to fancy and worth checking out in person as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Both of those works that you mentioned are, are really uh, remarkable pieces and really well worth the, the visit. Um, so, uh, I, Rachel, thank you so much. I just want to um, really uh, say how much we appreciate um, your great work at the museum. And um, we look forward to your next curator conversation because you'll be joining us again on June 17th. Um, when you'll be discussing uh, an exhibition project you've been working on called For the Record, Celebrating Art by Women. Do you want to yeah. give us a preview? I would love to. That has been taking up my mind for quite a few, oh, maybe a year now. Um, <laughs> That exhibition was actually originally slated um, the summer of 2020. And as we all know, things planned for the summer of 2020 did not go on as intended. Um, and exhibitions fared the same fate. So that show, for the record, Celebrating Art by Women, uh, will now debut almost a year after when it was scheduled to, to look at, um, to look at the vast contributions of women artists. And, and I know it's hard for many people to try to contend with this idea of identity and creating a show around someone's gender. It's hard to compete with that. It's hard to explain it away. But all I can say is that what this exhibition does is it provides some information about this idea of equity and that equity sometimes can only be understood through crunching the numbers. So what we do is we look at statistics of uh, different acquisitions and exhibitions all over the United States and how women artists fare in being represented in those exhibitions. And then we look at what the Norton's been able to achieve. And through doing that, we, we look at this vast history of uh, the contributions of women artists and, and say, you know, yes, maybe there has been underrepresentation, but, but let's look more vastly at art. At, at this notion of what's able to be produced by these artists. I think we are now close to over 50 artworks. It spans all of the special exhibition galleries. And it's, it's, it's very diverse. Like when you're, when you're grouping artists just based on gender, you're going to get a very broad structure. Um, so I think it'll be a fascinating thing for people to see. I hope they enjoy the way we position it. Um, and if not, it'll just be a visual treat. So I highly encourage you all to come back this summer for that. Oh, absolutely. And and that show opens on June 11th. And uh, and I, I will say, I, I just got a, a, a quick peek at the checklist and it is going to be an extraordinary array of work. And so thank you again. Re really appreciate your talk tonight. Thank you, Glenn, so much. Have a nice evening, everyone. Thank and ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, for, for joining us uh, this Thursday um, for uh, uh, Norton from Home. Next Thursday, uh, May 13th at 6 p.m., uh, we hope you'll join us again for Dominic Chambers' I Came Alive, I Could Fly, uh, a talk by artist Dominic Chambers, whose 2019 painting, A Moment in Yellow, 
has been a highlight of the Norton's current exhibition, Art Finds a Way. You can register for this event at norton.org. Until next week, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed the program. Be safe and have a great week.